Okay. Welcome everyone. And uh, uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to our uh, uh, event. Um, allow me to introduce myself, first of all, for those of you who, for those of you who uh, you know, haven't had the chance to, to, to meet. My name is Aaron Malici. I'm the creator of, uh, of and uh, co-founder of this bunker which is a new media platform and a think tank now uh, working on issues of democratization uh, in the Western uh, Balkans. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by, you know, uh, you know, first of all, saying sorry for inviting everyone again to, again to a Zoom event. I know everyone is tired of these. Uh, you know, it's been a very dehumanizing year of not being physically be able, be able to see and talk to people uh, live. So I almost felt like apologizing when, when sending out uh, the invitation. But again, thank you for finding the time uh, to discuss about uh, very important uh, issues. Uh, I'd like to just briefly begin by uh, explaining what, the, what this program is. Uh, we started this uh, uh, last year uh, uh, with the support of the National Endowment for Democracy and Rockefeller Brothers Fund, this series of studies on uh, the state of democracy in the Western Balkans. Uh, uh, we did a, uh, a bigger, more comprehensive uh, study on, on the entire region. It was published last uh, December on this state of illiberal, uh, uh, illiberal equilibrium um, for two reasons. One is that we feel that there's a need for more uh, uh, sort of regional thinking and knowledge produced from the region by activists and researchers and think tankers coming from the region, you know, so, uh, 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 sort of to give some grassroots opinion to audiences abroad, but also uh, to incite uh, uh, local uh, uh, sort of audiences within each of our countries to have more regional thinking and regional uh, picture of, of events. Uh, the second key objective is, you know, we feel that there is a need to uh, detach the story of democracy in the Western Balkans from the notion of Europeanization. I think these stories are now sort of started to, to go apart in a way with the crisis of accession. And, I, and at least I feel uh, that in a way as a region, we are a bit on our own. Uh, uh, sure, we have Western partners who can help uh, and it's a very, uh, you know, this external uh, anchor is still very important, uh, but there are limitations to what um, out the outside world can do to, to advance uh, uh, liberal democracy and, 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 and democratic standards in the Western Balkans. Today's event is a follow-up to our uh, last year's uh, regional report. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, as I said, you know, we call this state of affairs an illiberal equilibrium. I don't think the main narrative in the region is backsliding. There certainly is backsliding, but there are some countries that are actually moving forward. Uh, the, what, but, but what is common is that uh, uh, the region has these structural difficulties and none of us have, none of the countries have been liberal democracies. Uh, despite progress, that progress continues to be limited in some countries. And, uh, and even the countries that are backsliding, it's not that they are backsliding from, a, from, a, from any stellar uh, position in, in the past. Uh, today we'll be looking at two of our uh, uh, two policy briefs. Um, Produced by Borian Juzelov and Anna Marianovic Rudan, uh, uh, that look into uh, more deep into more detail into some of the issues we raised in the big uh, uh, regional uh, report. And uh, Borian will be presenting his paper first, since it's a bit, bit of a more uh, macro overview of the liberal, liberal equilibrium. And then Anna will go into uh, the, the the civil disruptors or civil challengers, we're calling them the, those who are challenging uh, the status quo. Uh, the, the, this will be followed by a panel. Uh, uh, bringing in two perspectives. Um, we invited Mrs. Uh, Vesna Pusic. Uh, you know, uh, since we will be starting to, uh, from people from the region, we're, we'll then have people from, you know, the near, uh, the Western, Western Balkans to give us, uh, you know, uh, a bit of a neighborly, you know, uh, uh, sort of perspective of some of a country that is near us, close to us, uh, very similar to us in a lot of, a lot of ways, but has, has entered the EU. And we feel that Mrs. Pusic, especially because of her experience and advocating for these values throughout her career, uh, either in politics or, or, or in other formats, can bring uh, very valuable insights. Um, and then we have uh, uh, Valeska Esch from uh, the, uh, the Deputy Executive Director of the Aspen Institute in Berlin, who just finished a very uh, big uh, civil society forum yesterday, uh, who can uh, give us a perspective of how things look from uh, from Berlin, and you know she's she's been dealing with the Balkans for for a very long time now, and she know also knows our, our our issues and challenges. And then we'll we'll open up uh, uh, the, the event for uh, for for an hopefully frank discussion on these on these issues. I'll end here, and you know uh, our my uh, my uh, friend Dani Lazi from the Kosovo Center for Security Studies will be moderating the panel and and, and the event. I'll uh, and you won't hear much of me until until the end. And I'll just like to thank the donors. 
um, Rockefeller Brothers Funds and, uh, and the National Endowment for Democracy for entrusting us uh, with this project. And I'll hand over to Borian to, to, to discuss uh, his policy brief. So Borian, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Agon. Um, as we discussed earlier, um, when you asked me to write this policy brief to address the problem of illiberal equilibrium, that you described very well uh, in, in the paper where we uh, also contributed. Um, I was in the middle of a great pessimism about the region, like many of you are still, I, I believe. Um, so I was really looking, to, uh, looking for potential triggers of change that have not been discussed much uh, earlier. And I got very inspired by several friends and relatives who currently work online and earn more than uh, anyone else in their families. So that's the basis of my idea, the basis of, my, of the brief I will present today. Um, but it's still better to, to start from the beginning. The focal point of, um, of the problems in the Western Balkans in, in my opinion, are the political parties uh, as key actors um, who perpetuate uh, the illiberal equilibrium. Well, they are declaratively pro-Western, pro-democratic and pro-rule of law. In practice, they are continuously compromising democratic values and are directly undermining the integration of these countries into the EU. Although they win elections and gain international legitimization on the grounds of their declared pro-European agenda, all of them or most of them uh, use their political mandates to informally exploit state institutions, um, to abuse public resources for private um, and party aims and to uh, aim to remain in power indefinitely. Um, on the other hand, due to the poor economic standards and the relatively low educational and uh, professional capabilities of the population, um, parties rule on the basis of clientelism, favoritism and uh, personalized networks of informal exchange. Uh, additionally, recent examples of turnovers of power in the region, uh, more notably in recently in Montenegro, but earlier also in North Macedonia, show that although um, democratic changes are still possible, they are not sufficiently sustainable to change the way how politics is exercised and to, in a way, modify the unwritten rules of the game uh, of politics in the region. And this is also due to the problem of weak counterweights to political parties who enjoy the monopoly in the political and social life. Their counterweights are like independent media or civil society. They are still weak and unable to provide alternatives to this uh, previously described um, clientelist modus operandi. And they uh, are often unable to destabilize the monopolistic role of political parties. Mainstream media are tied to party and business networks. Uh, while the civil society consists mainly of donor dependent CSOs who despite their important role and expertise as guardians of democratic values uh, are still having weak or no constituencies. And as a result of all of that, I believe there is really need for a novel approach uh, that will generate new pockets of social and political autonomy uh, that will be independent from party monopoly and uh, independent from the elaborated clientelist political economy. So um, the question is um, how to modify and change the unwritten rules of Western Balkan politics. 
although um, these turnovers of power provide notable democratization prospects. Um, I discuss in the paper that there is a cycle of contradictory politics that inevitably leads back to illiberal equilibrium and that uh, the change of actors and change of incumbents creates a momentary change, which is not sustainable um, because structural problems, primarily based on clientelism, continue to persist and to, to constrain the reformist agenda, even of the new actors in the field, new governments. So um, what needs to be done to, to, to generate, to, to alter the political demand? Uh, I believe there, uh, and I argue in the paper that uh, it's time for new uh, forms of civic activism, um, which will have more um, endogenous character and will be based on endogenous bottom-up uh, democratization. Uh, instead, the clientelist demand for party employments and favoritism that has overridden so far the demand for impartiality, professionalism, and good governance, we need a new democratization narrative that will be based on the new generation of people who are independent from the old clientelist practices. And here I came to, a, um, to, to some estimation uh, based on uh, World Bank data and also on some freelancing web pages, where uh, uh, particularly Serbia and North Macedonia are on the top of the world's list of freelancers per capita. So of people who earn from uh, global markets uh, based on uh, online labor, on um, who, who basically um, work for foreign individuals or companies and earn uh, notable uh, salaries that are sometimes two or three times or even uh, more uh, higher than, um, than the average salary in the country. And I believe that uh, all, although these numbers are indicative and probably insignificant to make an immediate political change today, they show a clear pattern that the labor market is evolving and that um, there are people who found alternative to the existing non-merit clientelist modus operandi in the region. And um, that these people really enjoy financial, but also political independence their parents never had so that um, they are a great opportunity for endogenous democratization and change of the political demand. And all of this may sound overly uh, optimistic. I believe that there are specific steps that need to be undertaken to uh, exploit this potential and first of all, I believe that um, what we can do is we can continue nurturing and supporting professional independent journalism via new innovative ways of um, uh, media financing, primarily uh, crowdfunding and other ways how people who already have decent salaries uh, can uh, contribute to um, these media outlets because due to the small market size, uh, the media landscape in the region, especially um, mainstream media landscape is really dependent on money from the existing centers of power. But if um, people crowdfund new uh, forms of journalism, that would uh, alter the, the, the media landscape and would offer new perspective to uh, not only to uh, 
to, to independent journalists, but also investigative journalists to unravel uh, potential uh, malpractices, corruption affairs, and so on. Another thing is, and this is more of a general uh, idea, is that there is need for um, reconnection to the citizens. So civil society needs to reconnect to, uh, with the citizens in order to create or recreate mutual trust between the existing advocates of democracy and their natural constituencies. Although the trust in the traditional forms of civil society is, is higher than trust in state institutions and political parties, citizens still remain uh, disconnected from CSOs and largely uh, and uh, rarely um, support or fund uh, civil society initiatives. Uh, and in order to change this, a larger number of people needs to be informed and positively affected by actions of traditional CSOs. Also, I believe that um, existing donor uh, strategies need to uh, put more emphasis on local development. Uh, in local communities that are even more affected by the described clientelist political economy and even more dependent, dependent on uh, the monopolistic role of political parties. But despite this, in many mid and small sized town in the region, there is still a significant civil potential that needs to be further nurtured and encouraged. And um, the existing actors, local actors of change need to be supported in order to revive culture, tourism, and informal education. And for instance, a positive example is the opening of EU Info Center in one remote city, uh, remote town in uh, Macedonia called Kriva Palanka on the Bulgarian border where there is a EU Info Center. And I believe that such initiatives will really also encourage these these young professionals who are the heroes of my story today uh, to, to stay and to earn their, their money in their small communities and then to, to push towards uh, positive change. And uh, although many of these um, thoughts may sound a bit uh, um, overly optimistic, uh, my, my major uh, message is that we have to stay patient because there is no quick fix. This next stage of democratic transformation of these societies will be a marathon and will, won't be a, a sprint. It, it won't be a, uh, an over, overnight change because the change of these uh, existing patterns of illiberal politics will take uh, time because in order to change the existing power structures that were nurtured at least three decades before, um, we cannot really um, break their domination overnight. Uh, however, this illiberal equilibrium can be deconstructed by the joint forces of the existing and the forthcoming change agents. And although parties will inevitably remain the leading political force, as they are everywhere, uh, their actions can be uh, determined by different political demands. And I believe that uh, the current change agents in, in these societies need to, in, in, or, in a way, uh, take, the, take advantage of the shifts in the labor market in order to encourage these young professionals to actively take part uh, in their local communities, um, to raise their voice against the male practices of the incumbent elites, um, to take action in various networks based on solidarity, trust, social innovation, but also to use 21st century te technology, not only to earn from the global markets as they already do, but also to nurture cosmopolitan values in their countries, civic communities, and their families. Um, I hope that this idea um, 
will um, resonate uh, well among um, you and among people who will uh, read this paper. And I hope that uh, we will um, we'll continue looking um, ahead uh, with emphasis on the endogenous actors and endogenous change. Thanks a lot, Borian, um, for this for this great overview of your policy brief. And you know, uh, your brief and Anna's brief are kind of, are very you know. There's a clear synergy between them. And I'll give the floor now to to Anna to talk about uh, the current uh, civic disruptors and uh, you know what is working well and you know how 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 to re-energize the civic sector. So Anna, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Well, uh, I will tell you about civic challenges, which are the organizations that undermine the illiberal democracies by challenging their legitimacy. Uh, but first, uh, let me let me see uh, let me tell you what creates the legitimacy of illiberal democracies. Uh, illiberal democracies, as we know, are systems where which at the same time try to retain democratic semblance while allowing extractive practices and abuses of power. So I would say that all the countries in the Western Balkans are are for now illiberal democracies. But this, uh, what is the strategy to, uh, to get, get the consent of the people, how to legitimize uh, illiberal democracy? So the strategy to legitimize the liberal rule domestically is to securitize daily political agenda. The securitization is a term borrowed from security studies, and I will explain how I would uh, implement it in this case. So uh, what the liberal gov governments do, uh, they continuously frame actors, events, and circumstances as threats to national economic health or any other security. Whether the danger is actual or, or not is less important. The portrayal of reality as threatening implies a fall to fend off the danger. So this imperative to protect the society is then used to, to justify the abuse, the abuse of power, the rapprochement to undemocratic foreign actors, to normalize the lack of reforms, and in a way uh, to portray the, uh, high, high, uh, the high officials as national saviors. So real or made up, uh, threats are mostly located in the realm of national security. Uh, the unsolved bilateral issues, the legacy of interethnic conflict, um, and uh, they allow for opportunities to build on myths of national glory, of victimhood and historical rights and the national stereotypes. Also, using the motives of traitors of plotting foreign agents, the governments are interpreted sometimes as critical, as, as the stability of governments is interpreted as critical. Building on racist and anti-Muslim narratives, Migrants are portrayed as, as danger to lives and properties of local, local <coughs> inhabitants. And also often used to justify rule bending linked to the inflow of corrosive capital is the promise, of, is the promise to end local unemployment, which is an uh, economic security trope, a uh, covert threat hinting at hopeless poverty in case of non-compliance. To facilitate the securitization, this strategy, which in a way uh, explains uh, why, why the leaders are taking certain moves and, and are avoiding reforms. And so to faci facilitate it, uh, the challengers are marginalized. So parts of administration, of judiciary, of independent bodies which are committed to food government, as well as opposition parties, are either um, co-opted co or corrupted or even threatened in, in different ways. They are, they are not part of the, of, the scene, of the political scene. Media are largely reduced to amplifiers of messages, political and economic elites, and the civil society is kept at gate, either through irrelevant or staged inclusions, while the loudest critics are often defamed, attacked, or even exposed to strategic litigation. So what does the civil, civil society do in, in the liberal democracies? Some parts of civil society abet liberal These are certain civil society organizations that help the legitimation strategy, sometimes as grassroots, but more often as uh, astroturfs established or backed by domestic or foreign governments or political parties. They're known as Congos and Pongos. They, uh, their uneven regional pro uh, prominence can be explained by different levels of authoritarianization in certain countries, and also by different, uh, different uh, tempo of, accession, of EU accession, because the later stages of EU accession uh, insist more on civic participation. Uh, the interviews I held when I, when I, um, when I did this research uh, even uh, mostly, mostly I got the answer that that Congos and Congos aren't really uh, threatening to to real democratic civil society sector, but more, more they could be more threatening in the long run as they grow uh, more consolidated and, and strong. Um, but uh, aside from this, this part of of civil society, there are civil society uh, organizations which challenge the liberal government. 
And uh, these are called civic challenges. So how do they challenge illiberal values? They undermine its legitimacy and they try to counter the marginalization which they are exposing. So uh, to counter the legitimacy of liberal governance, they either disclose or protest uh, against particular ca cases of extractive practices and repression, or they advocate for policy change towards the rule of law, good governance, social justice, uh, social, uh, social sustainable development and regional reconciliation, which also diminishes the persuasive power of populistic claims used in legitimation strategy. To counter marginalization, uh, the, these organizations build constituencies, they network, they uh, work to acquire political support from democratic international actors. They, they try to gain experience and then gain more professionals to work for them. And they also cooperate with parts of administration which are uh, committed to good governance. So uh, I will now illustrate the, the I, will, I will give you the example of how civil, civil, civic challengers go against liberal democracy. First, I will speak about civic challengers which desecuritize daily political agendas through action. One type of action is disclosure and protest against individual cases of extraction and repression. So these are, in, uh, the, the, these are uh, on one side, uh, investigative teams, fact checkers and watchdogs. And on the other side, this would be civic movements, uh, local civic movements. So let me tell you first about the ones who disclose, uh, who disclose the individual cases of extraction and repression. They're the most obvious threats to patron-client networks. And there are investigative teams like the non, uh, North Macedonian IRL, or Serbian Creek or Sins, Bosnian Sin or Bien Kosovo. They expose murky cases of privatization. They point to the ties of government officials with criminal circles. They prove their wealth. They question large urban and local development projects and other malversations. Uh, also, uh, they, even uh, their stuff is often subject to attack uh, and assaulted, exposed to smear campaigns. Uh, watchdogs, on the other hand, they follow public procurement and red flag particular cases, such as Bosnian Pratimo Tender Portal, or, or they engage citizen selection in election monitoring, like Montenegro's Center for Democratic Transition. Finally, fact checkers uh, fight the disinformation campaigns, they investigate polit polit politicians' claims, debunk conspiracy theories, etc. Et uh, the low rankings of media freedoms in the Western Balkans uh, warns of how instrumental these three actors are for democratization. The next type of actors which uh, protests against uh, abuse of power and extractive practices is our civil, our, our local civic initiatives. Uh, they have emerged around, around notice in Bosnia through plenum movement. This was the first known civic initiative. They're usually single issue or, or one off, and they they even they, they protest particular cases of privatization of eviction, urban development, uh, hydropower plants, etc. Uh, regardless of their individual output, their contribute to their contribution to challenging liberal democracies is in political activation of citizens outside capitals. Uh, even, uh, often through protests against local strongmen. Uh, the other types of civic challengers, so we now discuss the civic challengers that, that disclose and protest abuse. And now I'm talking about the other types of civic challengers which advocate for policy change. So uh, they, uh, th these are the organizations that do research like think tanks, but they're not think tanks. But apart from that, they do awareness raising and advocacy campaigns. I call these uh, organizations do tanks. And uh, do tanks uh, are, uh, countering the narratives used by securitization strategy. Um, a typical do thank is a humanitarian law center in Serbia, which you all know I shouldn't go into details further. Then in North Macedonia, a coalition of organizations offer fair trials. Then um, Institute Alternativa in Montenegro, Albanian Institute for Democracy and Mediation, Kosovo's Balkans Policy Research Group, Kosovo Center for Security Studies. Uh, and also um, there, there are organizations which, which counter the narratives of the populist narratives of securitization strategy by approaching the issues of security, the issues that are really belong to security matters, not from a nationalistic point of view, but more from a regional and more peaceful, more pacific uh, approach, such as Serbian Isaac Fund, Foreign Policy Initiative from Sarajevo, and others. Also, another way to uh, counter the narratives of, uh, to counter the, the legitimacy strategy of uh, illiberal democracies is to bring up issues uh, which, uh, which are different and which focus on, on such a problem such as uh, environment or gender issues, uh, or, or they promote uh, economic, uh, regional approach to economic issues such as Albanian cooperation and development research. Aside from these organizations, aside from do thanks, investigative groups, watchdogs, uh, fact checkers, and uh, civic initiatives, 
there are a lot of actors, tens or uh, maybe hundreds of actors across the region which protect, protest injustice and advocate for change. But these ones that I listed, uh, they directly and most frequently challenge the legitimacy of regular democracy in the Western Balkans, and that's why we call them civic challenges. So how do they counter democratization? Uh, sorry, how do they counter marginalization? First, through constituency building. And uh, this is different from for civic initiatives and for, for all other organizations. Civic initiatives need to have, they need to mobilize people for protest because the more people protest, uh, the larger is the cost of repression. And they try to do that through their social or community channels and, and uh, maybe networking between similar initiatives. But uh, a different type of constituency building, I would say that would be networking, will be more useful for other organizations, for do tanks, watchdog, investigative groups. So they join, join with similar organizations and networks, which gives them more strength. The other way to counter um, marginalization is to reach out to broader audiences. This is especially problematic issue because uh, all the organizations listed both use social media, try to get to traditional media, but as I said, traditional media are usually close to them. And there is no room for, for democratic uh, speech, I would say, I mean, in a larger sense. So uh, what we miss here in the region are the outlets uh, which can access, which, which, which can promote the democratic values, uh, which are non-partisan, non non-commercial, non-governmental, uh, but which uh, just uh, give the news uh, and uh, promote democratic values, talk about these news. I would say that we have some, these are being related portals, Buka in Bosnia or European Western Balkans, but they all have limited resources and only can target narrow population sectors. So civil society media are directly missed in the region, which is crucial to the outreach. Uh, in order to fight marginalization, civic, civic uh, challengers also try to acquire political support from democratic international actors, which gives them more leverage at, at the domestic field. They also uh, try to get as much expertise and prof professional staff as they can, uh, which is especially especially hard since uh, most projects, since most funding goes to our project base, and so they can they cannot retain the, the good staff. And uh, especially lacking staff experience, staff is, is is in the fields of economy, energy, social protection, staff, education, etc. Uh, we have we have more experts in foreign policy, regional cooperation, rule of law, and security, but the other ones are really in crisis. And finally, in order to counter marginalization, civic challengers cooperate with parts of administration, legislative, judiciary, and regulatory bodies, which are committed to good government. But this is uh, this approach is a th can walk the thin line between sustaining and countering illiberal democracy, because irrelevant participation should be avoided. It's sometimes it's just a mask and just a way of uh, showing to to uh, to the external factors that yes, we do we do include civil society. But on the other hand, there also may be opportunities to have impact and in time it could build a routine. So this would be uh, the ways in which um, civic challengers try to oppose marginalization. But uh, for the outcomes of particular civic actions countering liberal governments will hinge both on opportunity structures, but also on capacities and the leverage of civic challengers. The current donor policies seem not to be helping develop them either. Uh, several features of these policies are objected to by civic challengers. Focus on project-based funding, mandating cooperation with government and some grant schemes, and lack of coordination that would enable uh, large-scale projects. So what, we can, what can we conclude from all this? Uh, the extractive systems, the liberal democracies, will not be dismantled by itself. And as Bodian previously said, civic action is required for that. Many civic actors are democratic, but only some challenge in liberal governments. The one that either disclose or protest irregular uh, extractive action and, uh, and abuse of power, and also the ones that advocate for different values, for democratic values. Uh, the key problem for civic challengers is that, that they lack leverage, they, either based on the lack of, of finance, finances to resources, uh, either, out, either the lack of outreach. This is also probably the, the most important shortcoming that they have. And finally, without media attention, civic challengers cannot create a public demand for, for change. Uh, because far from media outlets, the majority of women men, men can relate to, so I, I would say, far from traditional media, the work of civic challengers does not translate to popular demand for change. Uh, to overcome this situation, civic challengers should be able to rely on civil society media, whose content would be dismissed by national networks of local media. Um, and I would say that, uh, the current support to donors of to independent civil society media, to non-commercial, non-governmental outlets promoting democratic values, is 
uh, by and large, project-based and then coordinate. And uh, in result, uh, even the most professional civil society media outlets uh, lack resources to both produce the content to be secure and secure that it, it is broadcast to region. Uh, a warning from uh, a warning comes from the past too. Um, na namely, the donor's decision in the early not no, 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 that independent media in the region, previously living off donor funding, should transform to self-sustainable outlets, quickly proved to be a mistake. The case in point is the Serbian radio and TV station B92, which had an important role in overthrowing Milosevic's regime in Serbia, to later be privatized and sold, completely losing its clout and democratic credibility. So uh, the track of its influence before that was the sensitivity to popular concerns, professionalism, enthusiasm, and also the reliance on an agile network of local media. So how to support civic challenges? I would say that democratically minded individuals in departments in central and local government in Western Balkan may publicly endorse civil challenges. That would probably help them and encourage them to approach them. They should also reach out to civil challengers, invite them to take part in policy processes. And finally, they should foster engagement to civic challengers in all the phases of policy process, not only pre-legislative uh, On the side of the EU, international democratic governments, regional and global organizations, they may incessantly encourage the Western Balkan leaders and governments to seek dialogue with civic challengers. Also, they should include civic challengers in regional summits and meetings as observers, but also with the right to take part in discussion, as this particularly pertains to uh, regional cooperation council and to the Berlin Council. And they can resolutely stand in protection of freedom of civic action. As for the donors, they should first know uh, civic civil society, real civil, democratic civil society from Gongos and Congos, but I don't think that this is too hard. What is too hard is to uh, finding a way to, to differentiate between uh, democratic civic society organizations and civic challenges. And perhaps donors should prioritize support to civic challenges based on two criteria. Uh, whether an action aims to disclose or protest the abuse of power and repression, or it, uh, whether it, it is targeted at advocating for policies forwarding democratic values. So these are the things that civic challengers do. And also, uh, the donor should bear in mind that an organization should have a relative a a leverage. Uh, I mean, media media uh, attention notwithstanding, because this is very hard for, for civic, civic, civil society to accomplish. So the donors can recognize the challengers of the liberal practice and give them priority. Uh, also, they could revisit the policies which curb the effectiveness of civic challengers, which means that they should take their ass assessment into consideration, that they, should, they shouldn't mandate the engagement with, uh, with governments or subgranting, which is something that organizations often often uh, do, not, do not like to, to do. And also, um, they, should, they, should, uh, as, uh, they should not mandate, mandate that, that uh, subgranting should be um, uh, part of the projects of, of Dutex. And finally, I would say that uh, uh, donors could help civic challengers build public demand for change. This would probably be the most important thing. So help civic challengers build public demand for change through two things. One is that in each country, uh, they should help develop one highly professional news portal immune to pressure from the elite. And that in each country, uh, they should develop one dense national network of local media that, that will disseminate the content that can, that can create public demand for change. So uh, with coordination of donors efforts, one civil society media outlet in each of the Western Balkan countries should be selected and developed into a high profile professional news portal producing content that promotes democratic values. For broad outreach, the content should be disseminated by a network of, of local media developed by in each country. And finally, as expensive as they are, the high profile civil society media outlets supported by the operative networks of local media might be the only hope for building citizens' demand for change before the region has slipped further into authoritarianism. Thank you, Anna, so much for your presentation. And also thank you, Borian. I think we have um, two very impressive um, papers uh, to help our conversation, but uh, we are also very honored to have two brilliant women with us uh, today to comment on this discussion, to open the discussion, Dr. Vesna Pusic uh, and Valeska Esk. 
Dr. Pusic is, uh, as you all know, um, um, a prominent um, um, a political leader from uh, our region, um, former de first deputy prime minister and foreign minister of Croatia. She was a candidate for the position of the UN secretary general and one of the founding members in 90s of the Croatia's liberal uh, party. So very honored to have you uh, with us. And maybe we will start with you, um, uh, um, uh, Dr. Pusic. Uh, uh, you've heard uh, Borian talk about being in a marathon to install the liberal democracy. You heard Anna talk about uh, securitization as in a strategy by, by, uh, uh, by governments to uh, undermine liberal, uh, liberal norms. I was in Zagreb in 2013 when Croatia joined EU. You have been part of this European integration process. Great enthusiasm back then. Um, so can you, uh, what's your impression of this discussion about the liberal um, uh, um, democracies in, in our region? Is European integration just a means? Does the job end with membership? Does it become easier or more difficult once in the EU? Um, so yeah, your take also um, uh, from this process, but also as, as, as someone from, from the region. Please, the floor is yours, Dr. Pusic. Thank you very much. These are two, Excellent briefs, very, very interesting. I was particularly enthusiastic because they somehow uh, agree with my two a priori creeds. One is that timing is everything or timing is crucial. And the other is that nobody can help you if you first cannot help a little bit yourself. And in that sense, I think that uh, European integration or the whole process of accession um, was an important uh, instrument, let's say, of institution building, state building, and democratization. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it changed. I mean, the times have changed, the circumstances have changed, the European Union has changed. Um, People have changed. I mean, from my generation to your generation, people have changed uh, in in terms. Technology has changed in terms of of enabling different forms of of uh, participation globally that were not there twenty or twenty five years ago. So, um, in that sense, uh, looking for indigenous, as Borian has said, looking for uh, sort of our own or society's own capacity for democratization and the uh, factors that could drive democratic change, uh, I think is crucial. This is really, really important. And um, you can maybe sound too optimistic at times, but um, I really don't think so. I really don't think so, because if you don't set your standards high, when backsliding comes around, and it will, and it always does, um, you have some leeway, let's say. You have, uh, you know, sort of some space to backslide and still not drown which is very important. And uh, I would say that explains or describes Croatia's experience the best. We were probably as far as democratic standards and institutions are concerned and their fact, uh, functioning is concerned, we were probably the best 2012 first, uh, and 2013, let's say. <laughs> we joined on July 1st, 2013. And there was considerable backsliding. I have to, in our defense, say that there was considerable democratic backsliding globally. In some of the oldest, democ oldest democracies on the planet, there was considerable democratic backsliding. So in that sense, um, it has been a, a, a major trend or a global trend. But the fact that Croatia uh, became a member when it did, saved our hides in many different ways. 
Uh, first of all, uh, we would have slid back way, way further than we did this way. And uh, also the whole, the, the, with all the, the, let's say, drawbacks, uh, disappointments, uh, unused opportunities, uh, we are today way better in every way, including our, let's say, weak democracy uh, than we were in 2000 or 2001 when we started the process. So it actually did help. Of course, our expectations are greater today than they were then. So we are probably much more critical. But in a way, in 2000 or 2000, until 2000, uh, we were in the state of, you know, thank God we are alive. And today our criteria are, are higher and, and we do understand what, and society at large understands what democratic institutions mean and what um, sort of, uh, in a way, uh, not meeting that criteria, what it looks like and why that is not acceptable or, or good. Uh, let me just mention a few comments that, that I wrote down as I was reading the briefs and now as I was uh, listening to the authors present their, their um, uh, papers. Uh, first of all, political parties and the criticism of the political parties. Uh, political parties are pretty nasty business uh, uh, in the Western Balkans, Croatia included. I led one for 11 years. I built it from nothing <laughs> practically. Um, but at the same time, political parties are the, one of the key original representatives of the civil society. They were formed as a way of uh, civic participation in the political process in the narrow sense, by political process in the narrow sense, I mean the electoral politics, meaning you know, standing for office, getting or not getting votes, uh, participating in, in running uh, the business of government either on the local or, or regional or national level. So um, at the moment, and I may be a good person to say that because I live and, and uh, come from Zagreb where um, a week, less than, the, than a week ago, uh, political, let's say, movement has won elections for the mayor by two thirds majority in Zagreb, a sort of green liberal left uh, political grouping who in the end, I mean, they were a protest group, they were uh, civic challengers, they were all kinds of things, digital nomads, but in the end, they formed a political party and stood in an election. And the question is, and I agree with everything that was said of political parties. Believe me, I know it's better than you think, I mean, firsthand from, from uh, absolutely the inside, uh, but at the end, in the end, you need you need a tool. You need something with which you will participate in the process because both of you are talking about criticizing the government and you know genuinely uh, opposing uh, these illiberal governments and trying through this opposition to improve them. However, you need somebody in the end who will actually take over. What if you succeed? What if civic challengers succeed and actually bring down the liberal governments? Then you need somebody to take over. And that you also have to think about. And the first step, let's say, uh, analyzing the Zagreb elections, I don't know how these guys will do. They're very nice young, women and men, 
But how they will do, I don't know. But to start with, I think it's enough to just say that Zagreb has voted for that type of option with a two thirds majority. It tells you something of the political climate in the city and possibilities. In the city were approximately between 20 and 25% uh, of the Croatian population lives. So you know, that just shows you the, polit the political atmosphere. Um, the problem with our, and the countries of the region, I would say Croatia included to at least some extent, uh, always in times of crisis sliding towards this illiberal democracy and this, this sort of authoritarian pattern. I think has uh, also other causes apart from greed, corruption, self-interest and all of the things that are present there. It is also the polit political, the only political culture that we know. This is part of the tradition of the region. We don't have a long democratic tradition uh, that we can invoke and that we can remember or our parents remembered or anybody else we knew and were in touch uh, with remembered. And we actually have to sort of invent it as, as we go along. We are also small societies. So finding two qualified teams to compete for leading the country, it's hard. It's hard to find one qualified team to actually lead the country. Also, um, one of the strategies of the uh, illiberal elites uh, has been to malign politics, to actually portray politics as a dirty and corrupt business. So anybody who, has any self-respect, a young person with self-respect doesn't want to get involved because it's a you know, pretty horrible thing. So I would rather do other things and, and uh, your parents, your neighbors, your friends, if you, uh, you know, get involved in politics, look at you as if something's wrong with you. <laughs> Why do you need that? And this has also been, been a strategy of actually a negative selection of people who go into politics. And so you have people who are the worst among us deciding on our lives through actually holding, holding political office and also discouraging people who, with better intentions and also better minds and better education to uh, at least for the part of their careers take part in, in electoral po uh, politics and, and uh, get involved, so to speak. Um, one thing that I have noticed recently is that in spite of political cynicism and uh, people feeling pretty much disgusted with politics. There is one thing that actually motivates and motivates the sort of common good type of, of people. And this is um, kind of um, the solid type of solidarity activism that shows results. Let me illustrate it. There was an earthquake at the end of last year in uh, central Croatia that destroyed a number of small towns. An incredible number, especially of young people, got active around it, self-organized, went there. People who you, know, you didn't see in any kind of political activism before, all of a sudden, uh, when they started rebuilding, started helping people, started you know, working uh, on projects that showed immediate results, they could see people they were helping and they could see the result of their work. 
and they were prepared to you know uh, sacrifice their time very often money uh, and and work on those issues this Mojima that won uh, the elections in Zagreb last uh, Sunday and, and got the mayor and the majority in the in the I think the one short of majority in the city council um, on their own. So they, also, they found already partners. Uh, they also started with activism. They were protesting for weeks and months. They were protesting, um, uh, let's say, urban destruction uh, of in the center of Zagreb, right here where I live, where they were destroying a park. Uh, different things that also sort of mattered to people and people felt an, an immediate effect of that and they could relate to that. And maybe in that uh, um, direction lies this possibility for new political mobilization. They also formed a group that's called People for People, where they go and you know, help individuals and they post it on social networks, help uh, people with name and surname uh, who are spe have specific, specific problems. And that is something that actually motivates people, unlike political parties. As I said, in the end, they will have to, to probably form political parties, but here is a form of activism and the form of measurable activism and measurable effects that I think might um, be the answer or might, might uh, be the beginning of the answer of how to mobilize people politically to actually act. Uh, we very often, and in the briefs, that is also uh, mentioned, um, invoke European values. And this is something that um, I would say we share. But at the same time, we have to be very aware that not all member states of the European Union share European values. And this is a great encouragement to the uh, illiberal leaders and illiberal elites in uh, the Western Balkans. Within the European Union, at the moment, we have a clash between liberal Democrats and right-wing populists. And all the you know, illiberal elites and presidents and leaders of the Western Balkan countries can always point to all the Orbans and Kaczynskis and Janshas uh, of this world and say, look, I mean, this is also happening in the, if they can do that in the European Union, how come we can't do that and we are not even negotiating? or we've started negotiating and they've pushed us back. And, and so uh, in that sense, that I would say is an additional argument in favor of being um, of the indigenous methods or indigenous uh, uh, forces that you need in all these societies, in all of our societies to actually uh, make progress and, and uh, go forward. Um, I thought the, the Borean's analysis of, of individual countries was also very interesting, but I will not go into that because that would take too, too much time, but I thought that was, that was interesting and I have some comments, so maybe we can share them uh, in the discussion. Um, I would also like to sort of one uh, mention one uh, warning footnote. A lot of um, hope in both briefs is invested in civil society and uh, civil challengers and civil society actors. Um, I think it's important to bear in mind that civil society actors can also be extremely reactionary. Many, many, many years ago, in the late 80s, there was an article by Tomasz Masnak, uh, um, 
Slovenian social scientist, called totalitarianism from below, where he um, analyzed at that time already the civil society actors who are reactionary, who don't want to expand rights and include different groups into you know, sort of equal rights concept, but actually wants to exclude and wants to reduce rights of different groups. It could be women, it could be uh, the uh, LGBT community, it could be people of different ethnic groups, it could be people of different age groups, it could be people of different region, it could be whatever you want. Very often also people of different political beliefs. Uh, but we had, for instance, the other day we had in Zagreb something that's called the March for Life. March for Life is supposedly a grassroots, definitely a civil society organization who wants to ban uh, family planning and abortion. And they're hell bent on that. And since they cannot mobilize enough people in Zagreb, they have buses and bus people in from all over Croatia to create this sense of you know, sort of a mass thing. People come, you know, they walk around a little bit. It's a, it's a great excursion to Zagreb for free. Uh, but they leave the impression that you know, it's a big thing. That also is civil society. They've learned that. You know, these uh, uh, forces in the society have also learned these tactics. So it is very important to um, sort of understand what segments of civil society can be bearers of change. And uh, one criteria is in my, for me, always reducing rights or expanding rights. If you fight to you know, take away something from somebody, <laughs> you're suspicious by definition. It doesn't matter how much your uh, genuine civil society uh, movement. Um, the idea of freelancers uh, as the answer. That's a, a great idea in my opinion. However, freelancers are also potentially digital nomads. And the question is, how much do they care? Because they're extremely independent. They have all, this is their advantage, but you know, an advantage in the sense of social activism, but at the same time, it's a disadvantage because if you know, somebody starts getting on their nerves too much, they move to a village on the coast close to Dubrovnik and work from there. And you know, what do they care? Or anywhere else. And um, so it has to have, I would say, these people have to have an element of, of social entrepreneurship, of actually wanting to do something for the society. Uh, being independent is, I think, a, a good prerequisite, but not a sufficient one. They need this additional social entrepreneurship culture in order to, to uh... and finally, and, and, and yeah. if, if I may add something on this, they, they need to uh, show willingness to stay in the country because we yeah. all have problems with brain drain. Um, and that's one of the downsides of the argument. No, no, of, of course. And, you know, people have this one life and they start thinking, what the hell? I mean, why, why am I wasting this on this stupid autocrats who are making my life horrible when I can move out and do something else? So, uh, you know, it has, there has to be, as I said, this element of wanting to stay meaning this social entrepreneurship. I want to do something about this, uh, this place. Also, one thing I, I uh, want to say regarding uh, Anna Mariana Rodan's paper, uh, the illiberal uh, democracies that legitimize themselves through, as she says, securitization. 
In other words, through turning every uh, criticism of themselves into a security issue. If you're against me, you're against Serbia, Macedonia, uh, whatever, uh, uh, Albania, uh, any country, because uh, it endangers us as a community and it endangers us as a country and it will make our road to the European Union more difficult, et cetera, et cetera. This is definitely true. But there is one other more obvious way of legitimizing illiberal democracies. And, and I think very important to bear in mind, and this is elections. Illiberal Democrats know how to win elections. And what they have managed to do is to sell to their societies and our societies very often, the notion that multi-party elections equals democracy. That if you have, if you won the elections, that means you can do whatever you want. Viktor Orban is a fantastic example uh, of that, but you have many, many others. Let's, let's say, for instance, Vucic, who called elections every time he thought the time was right in order to reinforce his majority in, in, uh, par in parliament. But I would say that uh, we have to be very careful because illiberal Democrats actually know how to win elections. They've learned that. They were against it at the beginning, but in the meantime, they figured it out with control of the media, with uh, uh, you know diff different fake news campaigns, with you know, and they actually will win, and they are winning elections. The question is how liberal Democrats can actually win elections. Because otherwise, that instrument will be uh, taken away, in a way. Yeah, and it will be very difficult to to uh, struggle with that. Um, also, one to to finish this, these remarks. Uh, one thing that that I think is important to bear in mind uh, the advice or, or idea that um, the donors need to support civic challengers, among all the other uh, advice that's, that's in the papers. I think you have to bear in mind that in a lot of cases, the donors are states, governments, not maybe regional governments, but European governments, American governments, different governments, they also have their civic challengers. And they're not necessarily so uh, overjoyed with civil ch challengers as such, because they have to face their own civil challengers uh, at home. And they very often see what we would call civil challengers and very positive forces as, uh, you know, wreck risers, as people who just create trouble and uh, uh, make it harder to, for the uh, government to function. The shortages are very few and far between. And uh, there, it's not uh, by chance that Shorosh and his role in the 90s in, in uh, Eastern Europe is so vigorously maligned by almost all the governments because he actually could afford to support civic challengers because he you know, didn't have any specific agenda in that sense, except the, uh, let's say you could criticize him for, for enjoying playing God and, and uh, supporting uh, critical voices. But other than that, no, he didn't, didn't care in the sense of, of having to face his own civil, civil challengers. Uh, finally, I would say that one thing that is also important to bear in mind, and it occurred to me only when one of you mentioned uh, Radio uh, B92. Uh, 
it is important to have turnover in government, to have people who are in government change, but it is also important to have a turnover in civil society because otherwise you have these, so the role of radio B92 can be taken over by somebody else and needs to be taken over by somebody else because over time, uh, the civil society organizations also get petrified and get sort of comfortable with their position and in many ways could then lose their purpose. Here, I stop. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pusit. So um, um, I, I thought there was a lot of food for thought there. I'm sure we will have um, a lot of reactions. I want to thank Anna and Borian for holding their reactions so that we also listen uh, uh, to some questions. We have a very impressive group of people with us today. I'll uh, pass on to Valeska. Um, uh, um, you, as, as we were talking before, um, uh, Germany has been in a way, a kind of a, uh, a country that the region has been looking up to for leadership when it comes to the European integration process. Um, so it would be very important to share your perspective, but also, I guess, pers German's perspective in of these issues of um, um, uh, democratic performance in the region and so forth. And you've had a civil society forum just um, um, <laughs> yesterday and day before yesterday. So, and you've discussed some of uh, these issues. So perhaps you can also share with us um, uh, some of those takeaways. Of course, I would uh, like to ask you to keep track of, um, of time. You. Um, in your Aspen events, <laughs> you know how difficult it is to keep this, but we have um, 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 until 4, 4, uh, um, uh, thirty to uh, uh, have some, some discussion. So yeah, Valeska, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dani, and, and, and thank you um, for, for inviting me. Um, I, I will try to, to, to keep it short. I agree with a lot that has already been said and, and also what was in the paper. So I, I was thinking, as, as you just said as well in my comments, I would try to include two different perspectives and not necessarily only share my own. I want to share with you what I observe in Germany on how today's topic reflects on enlargement debates here, why this makes the citizen-centered approach in the paper, in my view, so important, and where, in my view, the biggest difference is like for civil society organizations in Germany. And uh, as you said, I would use the opportunity to really share some of the initial results of, of the past two days of the um, civil society forum of the Berlin process. Um, and I, I actually want to start um, with, with how, how all of this plays into, into also the uh, credibility of the enlightenment process um, and, and how it's seen in, in countries like Germany. And um, I'm most certainly not going to contradict any criticism over the lack of credibility in the enlightenment process um, when it comes to the EU's credibility in the region. Um, but I really think we are in a mutually reinforcing downward spiral here, which, which, as I said, has a lot to do with our topic today. I'm personally deeply frustrated with the decision making in the council um, and the repeated use countries make of the possibility to block a council decision. This by far exceeds um, decisions on the Western Balkans. Um, it, you, you will find numerous examples um, for this only in the past few weeks. And it is something that seriously undermines the EU's role in general and not, not only in the Western Balkans. Um, but on the other side, I, I also see a growing concern about the credibility of Western Balkan governments and their seriousness in their EU integration efforts in EU member states. Um, and this concerns first and foremost issues of democratization and the rule of law, but you can also include other issues such as the commitments signed during the Berlin process. And, and this is exactly why I believe that a more citizen-centered bottom-up approach is so important. Uh, I agree with uh, what Vesna Pusic just said about the clash of values within the EU and, and what it means for the EU's credibility when, when speaking about values. But what I think is important not to, not to forget in this debate is that it, this even, even if this might undermine the EU's credibility, it will not change the importance that some member states, including Germany, where I come from, attach to this, these issues. To the contrary, um, my, my impression increasingly is that backsliding in member states rather reaffirms criti critics that democratization processes have not been sustainable and that we need to be even stricter and more careful with new accessions. 
Um, and, and this um, is also um, increasingly a challenge for, for the supporters the Western Balkans still have in countries like Germany. And I, I frequently quote a German politician who's a strong supporter of the Western Balkans, and I want to do this here as well, because he keeps saying, I cannot explain to my more skeptical colleagues anymore why it is that we want the reforms more than governments in the region. And um, this is an argument that I very often also hear when, when speaking to more skeptical, for example, members of, 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 the, of parliament. And this is what really immediately brings me to the role of civil society and also the two policy briefs. Um, I do not believe that democratization can be fully done from the outside. And I also do not believe it can only be done by governments. And that's why I think both papers have the right approach of putting civil society and especially citizens at the center. And, and there are some interesting ideas that, that were already commented. So, so I think I would uh, skip um, this part. What I think is extremely important is that um, where governments can respect the rules and governments can set the framework for it. I think it's, it's, it's so important to engage citizens. Democracy by definition requires politically informed and active citizens who understand their role within the system and who would also elect politicians who are ready to follow the rules and punish those who are not. And this is really not only a challenge in, in the Western Balkans. And this is why I believe that we really need to reinvest in civic education in all of our societies, including of course across the Western Balkans, but not limited to the region. Um, and of course, as, as was already mentioned, um, we need to also do this outside of our capitals. And I think this is really something where the EU and its member states, or at least those who, who, who still follow the, the idea of liberal democracy, can do a lot more. Um, and I am also convinced that this is the only way to work on preventing democratic backsliding, both in the EU more globally, but also in the Western Balkans. I also think it would uh, help rebuild trust in the capacity for democratic transformation um, with, within the enlargement process and beyond. Um, I think we need more knowledge exchange across Europe on civic education, and I think there is an important role for civil society organizations as well. Um, but, um, and this was mentioned in both papers as well, what, what, what of course is also essential is access to, to mainstream media. Um, it's not like civil society organizations in countries like Germany are consulted throughout all political processes and are always listened to. But of course, there are several prerequisites that, that really do not compare to, to the role of civil society or the situation for civil society in the Western Balkans. Um, there's a certain degree of readiness on the political side to hear and make use of civil society expertise, not necessarily through formal mechanisms, but just to give an example, it's not unusual for, for Bundestag to invite civil society experts to committee hearings and consult their expertise. Again, doesn't mean that they necessarily follow 100%, but at least they, they, they hear them. Um, I think we have a better functioning hierarchy in ministries, and at least in those that I'm familiar with. And this means that civil society expertise does not only have to be heard by the politicians themselves, but much more on the working level, which is responsible for shaping the, the policies. And I think this is something that to a great extent also helps civil society organizations um, in, in Germany. Um, but what I even find most important in all of this is that civil society organizations or citizen movements have a much better chance, of course, to build up public pressure through media and through being part of a public discourse. And, and this, this, is a, this is an aspect that I would really like to add to all of this by using legal institutions as well. So this is, again, also bringing us back to the rule of law. And I just want to give two examples from the field of, of, of environment, which is um, a very big issue um, um, also in our election campaigns these days. And of course, I mean, the most prominent movement um, here, as in many other countries uh, around the globe, was the Friday for Future um, movement. But and, and they had a huge impact on public debate and awareness. But what, what even, even made more of an impact is that some climate activists went to court over Germany's environment protection legislation, which led to a constitutional court verdict, which was quite remarkable as it gave sustainability and environmental protection, the level of a basic right for the younger generation and declared part of Germany's legislation anti-constitutional as it did not sufficiently spell out how emissions will be reduced after 2030 and therefore putting the main burden on future generations. There's also an older example um, of the Environmental Action Germany, which is an organization which since the 70s has been raising public awareness through campaigns, but very, very regularly also um, take legal action in the field of pollution, consumer rights, etc. Um, and 
the, the effects are much bigger than only the legal proceedings, which of course have their effect as well. But this, the, the, the court decisions go also go a long way of influencing public debate. Um, we, we have these, these kinds of examples, of course, also in other policy fields, but I don't, I don't want to go too deep into the examples um, in, in the interest of time. Um, so yeah, all of this obviously requires also media environment ready to actually pick up issues of common interest and does not only shape public debate along the lines of elite agendas, but as I said, it's also very important when it comes to, to the role of courts, in my view, that, that really should not be underestimated in this. Um, yeah, which brings me basically to my final points, um, um, the working group results of the civil society forum, um, we had two working groups out of 10 on exactly the two issues that we are talking about here as well, and which to a large extent also confirmed the approach taken in the papers, there may be also some of you have been have been part of those working groups. Um, I will only very briefly highlight the key messages as work on the final outcome is still ongoing and we will publish uh, the results in, in the forthcoming days. But um, the working group on the role of civil society in strengthening democracy came to very similar conclusions like we have found in the papers. They advocate for a more direct relationship with citizens of civil society organization, include citizens more as their constituencies. Um, they call for a mutual engagement also of the different actors that I think, Anna, you have also uh, mentioned in, in depth in, in your paper, um, and to, to mutually engage with grassroots organizations, think tanks, capacity builders, and watchdogs about the issues that have tangible importance in everyday lives of citizens, um, and this way also work on stimulating demands among citizens for, for better governments, uh, governance. Sorry. Um, they also identified a need to work on planting the seeds for a new generation of activists and civil society actors also outside of the cities um, to also meet the growing disengagement that they felt uh, citizens had from political processes. Um, the need for solid information platforms to overcome media barriers was of course also an important issue and um, also the, the donor approach or, or the issue of EU assistance was, was raised um, with a call also to provide more flexible resources to respond to changing environments. And just very briefly, and I would close with that, um, the part of the results of the working group on countering disinformation and strengthening media um, independence um, on the one hand, uh, of course, um, they called for the role of the state to be limited and the state may not interfere in content of media, independence and capacity of public broadcasters needs to be strengthened. Um, they, they also addressed um, issues with media regu regulatory bo bodies across the region. Um, but, and, and, and this, is, this is also an issue that I find extremely important, the issue of media literacy as well. Um, yeah, I, I would maybe skip also the part um, um, of, of, of the list of what the EU can do to, to strengthen um, media independence from their view. And as I said, we will publish the, the results and the full picture also of the results. I'm really just giving a few, a few um, headlines here uh, in the upcoming days. I, I would leave it at that to, to leave enough time for, for the discussion and I look forward to it. Thank you so much, uh, Valeska. Um, uh, Dr. Pusic, thank you, Anna and, and Borian. So I'll open the floor for questions and, and comments. I was expecting that I would be having a very difficult job to put up the list, but I do not see any hands raised uh, through, the, through the system. So if you have not used that, this is the time to signal if you want to take the floor uh, for, for a question or a, uh, or a comment. Oh, we have Sonia. Okay, so Sonia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. It's uh, great to see you guys, although it's on Zoom. Uh, Agun, I'm grateful for you gathering us all. I'm excited just for seeing you guys online. Um, I volunteer to speak first as I'll have to leave uh, due to other commitment. Um, as this is a topic, um, I also spend a lot of my uh, private time and professional uh, uh, hours uh, thinking about. Um, and I wanted to make two points. Um, one is about the level of our um, ambition. Um, I think it should depend on diagnosis of situation. Um, and I don't think it's uh, the same situation in all of the countries. Um, and I think we, we should distinguish at least between the three types of uh, objectives. One objective uh, could be um, to slow down regression. 
So it's a not very optimistic scenario, but it is to slow down the negative things that are going on um, and especially to slow down the, or to protect the um, democracy defenders from the threats and pressures they're exposed to. Um, and this is more kind of reactive defensive uh, strategy uh, that is required. Uh, the other one uh, could be to try to preserve status quo. And this is more or less what uh, most of the organizations um, in Serbia these days is doing, trying to explain why certain pieces of legislation should not be redesigned um, under the excuse of EU accession while the protection of rights and checks and balances is being uh, uh, disintegrated. And then the, the, um, the third objective is actually to change and improve situation. But that one is only if we manage to fulfill the first two, you know, to slow down or, and to preserve what we have in order to build uh, uh, back better uh, situation. So I, what I wanna highlight is that we need a good diagnosis and we need thinking spaces like this exchange today uh, where we could think about strategies and not just react to the everyday um, events. The other thing I wanted to uh, make point about is about the relationships. So we heard um, Anna speaking about constituency building and you know talking to citizens. But again, I would say before going out and talking to citizens, um, I know also our friends from Mojimo did not go out and build the movement before they built the relationships within the civil society. And what I'm seeing, especially now that I'm a bit more distant and you know helping on the sides is that many of my colleagues are burned out uh, under great pressure. And I think there is a lot of need for um, building, rebuilding resiliency uh, within the organizations, but also among the existing organizations. And then we can speak about the, uh, you know, building relationships among the actors that may have not cooperated before. I don't know, think tanks and, and local initiatives or professional uh, associations and, you know, business associations or uh, whatever. And the third thing, and this is something I haven't seen any of uh, professional NGOs doing, and this is, for example, uh, something our friends in Mojimo did, is, um, good old one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship building. So, you know, we are very competent in um, communicating via events, uh, social media, uh, but very few organizations are ready to go and speak to people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and this is something that I found um, very interesting uh, in uh, publications, uh, that got out from lessons learned in the US last year uh, in trying to recover from uh, the Trump's election and you know, changing the outcome in the last year's election. One of the, the big lessons was that you know, they, they went out and literally talked to people one-on-one -on -one and then tried to involve them in activities. But before we would be ready for such a thing, we need to preserve um, what we have um, and to strengthen the relationships that uh, uh, exist. So that's what I wanted to share and to thank you again for convening us and hope this is just the beginning of a regular exchange. Thank you so much, Sonia, also for breaking the ice and for very um, a good outline of some of the key points that, that you mentioned. Um, so I do not see any hands raised. And I also don't want to put it on the spot, but I see we have Dr. Pierre Mirel with us, who has been with our region for a long time. Um, and perhaps if you don't mind to share your, um, your view, um, your take on, on, on this discussion, but also about the region, are you more optimistic or pessimistic uh, in terms of democratic performance and the role that the European integration process uh, has played. Uh, as Valeska was saying, EU cannot want the domestic reforms more than local governments. 
But at the same time, we have this understanding that sometimes the reforms being asked for are not helping liberal democracy, uh, but uh, these elites want to stay more in power. So Dr. Miral, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to, uh, to speak. Well, actually, I sent a short question to Vesna Pussy. Maybe she had not seen it uh, yet. One of the questions I have is, you know, until 2013, 14, 15, more or less, in that period of time, there was great optimism in, in, uh, in the region, right? Um, and then within a short period of time, it all went wrong, be it on democracy, reconciliation, recom, what have you. Uh, and, you know, I thought that uh, she might wish to share with us uh, what, why in that short period of time it, it all went wrong. So that's sort of, of question. But regarding your own uh, question, I'm rather pessimistic, I must say. Um, I, will, I will make maybe a, a, a provocative remark to, to uh, you representing think tanks or NGOs. I have the feeling sometimes that um, you are a bit like the, uh, some socialist and social democratic parties in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, what I mean is living in sort of bubble, um, talking to each other, uh, having, uh, you know, uh, webinars on, on common issues. You know, we could have once uh, every day, one every day, uh, saying the same thing, uh, you know, talking about enlargement, fighting about corruption, what have you. And so what? Uh, and now you look at the socialist, social democratic uh, parties in, in, let's say in France, for instance, my country, I mean, it doesn't exist anymore. It, it collapsed. Why? Because of one who said that, uh, one of you, Valeshka, maybe, that, that, that the, 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 the members of the party stop talking to the citizens, stop visiting the citizens, stop meeting, you know, one-to-one uh, uh, -one with the citizens, and instead had the wonderful uh, seminars on, on, the, uh, on, on this and that, but completely isolated from the citizens' key interests, including questions of security, which are in the heart of, of citizens' interests today. And that was left, in a sense, to far right people. So don't take it uh, you know, uh, uh, too bad, but sometimes you know, I've been joining um, meetings or seminars with, uh, with you uh, since a couple of years, and I have a bit that feeling. And I think one of the, some of the remarks which have been made this afternoon are very, very valid to, you know, uh, get out of, of the uh, somehow small circus and enter into more direct discussions with, with, uh, with the citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mirand, for, you, for your thoughts. And before I invite Vesna for, for her reaction, I also wanted to put on the spot Visar. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, ask your reaction, Visari Meri, uh, who is a, a highly experienced um, um, individual whom I respect coming from both uh, uh, having experience in politics and civil society. And one of the points that uh, Vesna mentioned about uh, illiberal leaders trying to make politics purposefully malign so that they discourage young people to, uh, to participate, but also this accusation um, 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 against civil society uh, that Anna mentioned of sometimes abetting illiberal governance. Uh, and Visar has been uh, on different sides of the, of the aisle with Ved Vendose for a long time, uh, trying to promote some of these democratic values. So Visar, wh what do you think? Thank you, Don. Thank you and hi, everyone. It is a very, uh, I think, fruitful discussion in sharing the experiences uh, of the countries in the region where I think that al although we live in slightly different circumstances, I think that we are facing a lot of similar problems. And uh, in this respect, I think that uh, uh, driving, uh, fr deriving from the uh, Kosovo case, uh, I think that one of the biggest uh, risks that we fear is that uh, it is the same movement uh, that was seen as this cornerstone of uh, citizens organizing themselves uh, against uh, uh, the establishment uh, parties, which were seen both corrupt and sometimes lacking in uh, democratic potential. Uh, that same movement is actually presented or be, is seen currently as the biggest threat to liberal democracy. So I think that we have to be aware of this uh, 
uh, of, of uh, focusing and investing only on methods or, of organization without having the political discussion that should go with it. Because I think that, uh, as you uh, mentioned, on my experience in the Mendoza is that uh, we started as a social democratic movement of citizens with a uh, quite uh, acute, I would say, anti-colonial uh, discourse. Uh, but then in order to become more popular uh, electorally, uh, the current with Mendoza became a casual party. So in this sense, I would like to raise the issue and expect uh, from uh, our panelists maybe a reaction to that, into how do they see ideology, political ideology should work in this discussion? Because uh, focusing and investing on the biggest obstacle, which is bringing down uh, illiberal uh, uh, governments, obviously is necessary, but I think that more necessary uh, to the more important to talk about is the aftermath. So knowing where are we running from or running away from is very important, but also trying to ascertain what are we running into becomes very important as well. Otherwise, we can miss uh, uh, the road. And I think that this is, and I don't know whether Dan and Agon would agree to this because they have the experience as well in Kosovo, but I think that this is the, 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 the pitfall of Windows and the, the current uh, uh, election results that we had on 14th of February. 50% of the people knew what they are running away from. But I think that only 10% of them are aware of where, where are we going to. So this is the biggest, I would say, currently in Kosovo, biggest risk to, uh, to uh, liberal democracy. Because the, in, in, in the discussion, the anti-corruption discussion, and the necessity that has been built or perceived by the people in this direction, this is actually uh, 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 becoming a sort of a policy or ideology that makes everything else uh, uh, permissible. So basically, if you want to fight corruption and crony capitalism, then you should have your hands free in order to do that, uh, sometimes by the procedures of the law, but sometimes even not respected. So I think that uh, the anti-corruption mentality that has been built in Kosovo, which is to an extent objectively based, uh, can uh, be uh, at the same time, uh, can be used as something that will curtail our uh, individual freedoms. So ideology, I think, is important. Uh, uh, organizing citizens and coming closer together is very important, but also bearing in mind and being aware of what we are establishing. The second thing that I would like to raise as a question, again, uh, driving from different experiences, uh, uh, is this, uh, is this uh, something that needs to be done bottom up? And is it necessary to be done bottom up? Or can it be done with a sort of like an ideological and political proposal that comes from a group of people and then is extended within the cities? And that is, again, dependent on circumstances. Sometimes the bottom up approach is much more fruitful. Sometimes the other approach is much more fruitful. So this is again a big question. And the third question that I really think uh, uh, we need to be aware in the region, especially uh, in particular countries, especially, is that uh, uh, we need to talk a bit more about how we are going to build uh, political proposals uh, that go beyond ethnic nationalism. Because I think that ethnic nationalism, especially in the Balkans, is one of the biggest threats to liberal democracy especially in countries, uh, multi-ethnic countries like Kosovo, Bosnia, Macedonia, to an extent Serbia as well. So in this sense, I think that uh, 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 any sort of uh, uh, political movement uh, uh, and uh, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which aims at creating a truly uh, liberal society needs to take this into consideration and not again fall within the pitfalls of short-term goals and damage the long-term initiatives and aims. Thanks, Dan, for giving me the word. Thank you, Vissar. And uh, uh, again, sorry for putting you and Dr. Miran on the spot, but I thought it would be good to have your reactions on, on that. So I want to invite uh, Vesta to answer the question that Dr. Miran has posited, if you manage to uh, read it in the chat. 
Um, and then I'll just invite a couple more people and, and come back to Borian and Anna for the concluding remarks, if that's okay. I know you guys are burning perhaps for some reaction to some of the things that have been said, but appreciate your your um, uh, your um, um, patience and yeah, and then and Valeska. As well. So let's not. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, the, the question that Pierre asked, it was great to see you, uh, was what happened 2014-2015 after Croatia joined uh, European uh, Union? Why was there uh, backsliding? Uh, I used to think that joining the European Union and the whole process of joining the European Union meant that this is how we are going to um, get a shortcut to uh, creating you know, institution building and creating a democratic state. And it is, but uh, it takes much longer actually to build a democratic political culture. And what we did with the accession process was create the let's say the the uh, road signs and the institutional infrastructure uh, within which we can actually and I think we are, but much slower, of course, than changing formally the institutions. We can actually start building a democratic political culture. Uh, in terms of people's expectations, in terms of not agreeing to authoritarian types of leadership, in terms of opposing, uh, restricting the, the uh, media freedoms. In other words, in terms of opposing all the illiberal uh, signs. And I would say without joining the European Union, we wouldn't have had these lampposts, these roadmaps. Uh, in how to go about building, because it's not enough to build you know, an institutional infrastructure. You actually have to build a democratic society. It, and that takes time, but that is almost impossible to do without this institution, building this, this at least basic institutional infrastructure to begin with, because otherwise you will only have, you know, brave and smart people who are fighting against you know, incredible odds without any chance of ever winning. We actually have a chance of winning now because of that, uh, of that infrastructure. And I think that that is very important and has been very important. And also I would like to say a sentence in defense of having this discussion, as you said, among ourselves. Um, these are people who spend a lot of time, um, let's say under adverse circumstances, being attacked by the government, being attacked by the government media, and occasionally you actually need to get together and uh, replenish a little bit your, your strength and batteries, but you're absolutely right. The rest of the time you need to be out talking to, to people and uh, the election uh, results of the local elections in Croatia have definitely proven that. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Pusit. I want to bring in again, to put on the spot, two other people. Uh, my dear friend Milica, if you are um, listening to this conversation, I think one of the things that was mentioned, this idea of civil society, perhaps losing the ability to talk to citizens, you know, on a more, um, uh, in person, I think that's, I guess that could be the, the uh, situation. I know Milica um, deals with a very difficult environment, works in a very difficult context, um, promoting some of these values, um, democratic values. Um, and I think the community with which Milica works, it's while we are talking here at the macro level, I think they're dealing in reality with some of these challenges that we are mentioning. And secondly, I would really appreciate if Ivan uh, Vevoda could also have 
um, uh, pitch in with, with his reactions from this conversation, but I, uh, uh, and then we'll have uh, Valeska and then the final points from the, um, from the two authors. So Milica. Hi, Dani. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for giving me the word. I apologize for not uh, uh, putting on my camera, but I'm in my kids' room, so I guess I wouldn't look too serious, <laughs> but it's a necessity. There's no one to take care of her. Um, regarding your question, uh, yes, uh, it is quite a challenge, especially for uh, the civil society organizations, uh, which as, as mine work uh, in um, primarily in Kosovo Serb um, areas. Uh, in fact, we just did a, a perception survey on how CSOs are perceived by our community and 65% uh, claim that they do not even know what we do an additional 40% um, say that they uh, do not trust us. And what is like the biggest slap in the face, 23% believe that our impact on uh, the level of respect of the Serbian community rights and interest is negative. So uh, it was really um, difficult. <laughs> Uh, to face with these uh, results. So it's obvious that uh, we are facing some issues. I cannot say that the organizations themselves are, are to be blamed because as you said, it's a very particular context. Uh, we are working uh, against what is perceived as political interests of a very uh, hegemonous um, political party, uh, subscalist, and we even occasionally uh, become a subject of, of their uh, smear campaigns. So it's really, uh, it's, it's obvious that we will, if we want to, uh, as you said, connect a bit closer to, with the society, we will have to change something in our approach. But um, there is the, this fact that our uh, context is very specific, not, I wouldn't say that it's um, more difficult than in other uh, Western Balkan uh, contexts, but it is a bit more peculiar. Uh, what we will try to do, I, I'm not sure uh, how to, to better reconnect, uh, but definitely uh, we do need to find uh, some allies in terms of uh, the, the network of the media and uh, one of the, the policy briefs presented today um, actually does outline a solid, um, a solid, let's say, media strategy, including uh, the call for creation of, uh, I, I cannot now remember to, how to quote it, but I think it was said, uh, dense network of local media outlets, independent, of course, outlets which would further uh, uh, distribute information that, that will be centralized, produced by a uh, a bigger uh, media outlet, something like Guardian. I think it was um, it was connected to that. So I think that at this point, this is our only way out to find um, more understanding in the in the media sector uh, and more appreciation of our work. Because I do believe, do understand as someone who was also at one point in the media, I know that they don't have time to closely follow. Uh, civil society activities, because most of them are very, as this one, very detailed, but they, but they do contain very uh, important information. It's just that um, the media space now doesn't have as much uh, time to digest um, these very convoluted and complicated um, conclusions, but they have to find some understanding for how much uh, we are working on. That's uh, it for my... Um, intervention now. Thank you so much, uh, Milica. And Ivan, I'm sorry to put you in a spot, but if, if you would want to share with us also your reaction, you've been for <laughs> quite some time with these democratization efforts uh, in a region. And I would also pose to you this question of, do you see the region moving more towards um, illiberalism and this idea of, of Sonia perhaps of, of our reactions, can we slow regression, or what is our uh, our options? If Ivan is hearing us, if not, I guess Valeska could could go could come in. Yeah, Valeska, you wanted 
to add something as well. Yeah, sure. I, I just I wanted to to react to to some of the things um, that, that were, were said, and I, I would like to start with what Pierre Mirel said about the I think you said think tank bubble, and this is this is actually um, also an observation that that I would share, and I think really also this issue, and this is what I liked so much about about the two policy papers. Um, this issue of constituency, I think, is a very important one, and there is there is a lot of efforts in in my perception um, by civil society organizations and think tanks from from across the region um, towards outside constituencies, be it the European Union or be it member states. And I think this is extreme. I think it's extremely important. And I actually I'm, I'm myself running a project in, in in Germany, really bringing together also civil society organizations from the Western Balkans with the German government to help them understand better also the views of of civil society. And I think it, 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 it's going a long way because I sometimes feel there is a bit of an understanding also like lacking of how deep problems run. Um, for example, my, my impression was that the, the European Union only started realizing um, how important the issue of, of media, for example, in Serbia is after it became itself victim of anti-European narratives in, in, in Serbian media and how the European Union itself learned that they were not able to really make it into the mainstream media with, with, with the positive narrative um, um, because of that. So I, I think this is a very important role, but I think it cannot be the most important role. And again, that's that's why I like um, the, the approach, the citizen-centered approach. Um, and I wanted to also respond to, to what uh, Visa was saying, not necessarily all, only, only related to, to Kosovo and Mendoza, but I think when it comes to um, party ideology or political ideology, um, and, and I mean this now in the sense of really having party programs, I think this is really something that's lacking in, here, here in, in, I'm saying here because we're together, but obviously I'm talking, I'm talking about the region. I mean, um, we have political party programs of 100 pages. I don't think they should be so long. I don't think there are many citizens who actually read them, but I think party programs should consist of more than three bullet points, and it sometimes feels political parties don't, don't really have these kinds of programs. And I'm actually also, I would agree um, with, with some of the um, um, seemingly more democratic forces um, that ideology um, uh, is, is overtaking. And, and Lisa, what you were saying about um, since my ideology is right and that, that since I am in it for the right reasons, this is why also the end justifies the means and I can skip the institutions or I can I can undermine them. And this is where I would like to echo also what Vesna Pusic was saying with, with, with the importance of, of institutions. And this is also why I was bringing the examples of court decisions from, from Germany and how it helped civil society organizations to really have an impact. Um, I think we can we can also talk about the role of, of opposition in the Western Balkans and of parliamentary cooperation, but but I, I don't think we have enough time. But but I think this is also a very important factor. I don't see any cooperation in parliaments across party lines. It's all about the own political party agenda. There is not even really cooperation among opposition parties to maybe question government on, on, on issues. So I think there are all of all of these issues um, that, 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 that are extremely um, um, important. And yeah, I would leave it at that to leave enough time also for others to comment. Thank you so much, uh, Valeska. Uh, and I think, I don't know if Ivan is back, but no, okay. <laughs> I'll. Uh, I'll invite Anna and then Borian to um, uh, for, for their um, fi uh, concluding remarks, and then invite uh, uh, Agon um, to um, or I don't know if if Ivan is trying to to speak now or no. Perhaps okay. Sorry. So Anna, the floor is yours, and then Borian. Um, um, uh, yeah, if you can wrap it up uh, in uh, uh, three minutes, that would be very appreciated, uh, I think, by, by all. Thank you so much. Uh, I will make just three final comments uh, in response to what was heard here. Vesna um, Pusic said uh, that, or she asked, what will you do if you win? I just have to make a difference here between uh, civic, civic initiatives, which are small local movements, or maybe larger, that do not have the ambition to win, and the movements larger, such as uh, Mura in Montenegro or Nedavimo Beograd in Serbia or uh, Mojimo in Zagreb, that, that do have the ambition to enter political life. But I think that the ambition of the, the civic initiatives and the other uh, NGOs, uh, the, other, the other civil societies, is to remain in civil society and kind of be a 
critic from the outside in a, in a positive way. And uh, what, what, what she also said, what you also said, is about petrification of the NGO sector, which I completely agree with. And that's why I think it is very important to make a difference between civil society organizations, which do contribute in a way to democratization, and the ones which really challenge the liberal democracy in a way of, uh, which, which I mentioned, uh, which, which, uh, which, which pose challenge and uh, which uh, either point to uh, misdeeds or point to abuse of power uh, and call for, for change or the ones that advocate for democratic values. And finally, uh, what Vissar Imeri was saying about the ideology that would transcend ethnic nationalism. I really like that thought, but I think it would be way too ambitious to think about just one ideology that would transcend uh, ethnic nationalism. I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is Bratsalidinism or Brotherhood Unity, the ideology that transcends uh, from, from now. But uh, it's, really, it's really interesting to discuss and, and probably think about what is the ideology that now stands behind the regional cooperation, other than infrastructure, economic cooperation, etc. That would be an interesting topic for some other discussion. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Anna Porian, the floor is yours. Um, I would like to thank all of the participants for their insightful comments and reflections. Um, without uh, prolonging too much the, the discussion, I have several things to mention, but I will focus on, uh, on the, one of the core ideas that were in a way also mentioned uh, partly in my paper, and that's the division or distinction between well-organized, um, institutionalized civil society organizations that have funding and know-how but don't have constituency, and um, constituency-based civic initiatives with no or with very little funds and sustainability. And I believe we should aim at um, bridging that gap, closing that gap, um, in order to ensure that um, civic initiatives that have a lot of enthusiasm um, become more sustainable and more, um, uh, while in the same time, uh, civil society organizations that preach values, that have expertise, um, uh, become closer to citizens. So in a way, events like this that would normally occur in some expensive hotel venues should somehow become more available to citizens. And expert reports that we often write should have a better storytelling element to, to be a more directly um, um, distributed to citizens so that citizens trust us more and believe in our work more so that they start supporting and nurturing um, their uh, own initiatives. And hopefully this new generation I'm, I'm uh, celebrating will, uh, have, uh, will, um, will realize its potential because otherwise, it can also uh, end up in a reactory form, uh, as uh, Dr. Kusic mentioned. Uh, th these people uh, have financial independence, and now it's time that we as um, established, so to say, democratization actors, that we manage to, it, it's up to us to encourage their civicness. Thanks, Boria. Did you conclude your remark, yeah? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, just uh, to thank Borian and Anna for the wonderful presentation and to thank Dr. Pusik for, uh, uh, and Valeska uh, with uh, Aspen Institute Germany for their um, um, uh, participation and comments and to thank everyone, the remaining 22 people who are staying with us until the end for these two hours of discussions. I think it was um, a lot we can take from this discussion. Um, and I want to pass the floor to, to Agon to, to conclude this. Uh, okay. This. 
Thank you. Definitely, the, the mental energy is now starting to fade out. It's also the time of the, of the day. I, I really appreciate this, this, this discussion, the presentations. I'd like to just conclude with a couple of you know, key words or that I at least picked up. A lot of things were said. These are, these are very complex issues. You know, we're talking here about how to, how to open up or defend democratic space in some context, or, or just how to create buffer, as, as, as Vesna said, you know, to also, the buffer is also important for when the bad day, days come. So the key words that I, I think there was sort of more uh, a broader agreement was that, you know, it has, this has to be indigenous, this has to come from, from, from domestically, we cannot rely on the external pull. It has to be uh, challenging or disruptive, uh, but we need to distinguish between the positive and the negative. There's a lot of negative uh, uh, energy coming also from civil society. It has to, it can be political in cases as Zagreb has shown, uh, but in order for that to happen, we need to start building relations. Uh, uh, this was also mentioned by Sonia, I think. Um, and then Son Sonia also mentioned something very important that we need our analysis also has to be context context specific. Uh, you know, not all, you know, uh, not all cases are the same. And uh, sometimes we need to defend, sometimes we need to, we need to, to assault. Uh, the other, th other important thing is what Borian started with in the beginning, I think, was the issue of patience, that this is a marathon, and it's closely also related to, uh, to what uh, Vesna also talked about, political culture and democratic culture, and, uh, you know, our, 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 our limitations in, in that regard, you know, these things uh, take time to build. And, um, and also, I found also Visar's point about ideology being important, you know, if we want to change the narrative and build new narratives, you know, it, it can, cannot be only a critical narrative against that deconstructs the current system, but also builds a positive vision of, you know, of, and, and it's clear about that vision because otherwise we, you just get a change that has a packaging, but then when it comes into power, it starts to collapse immediately. And, and I share Visar's fear uh, about uh, Kosovo's case, uh, uh, especially. Um, uh, in the end, I'll end with what, what, uh, what Mr. Premier Mirel said, but also it was mentioned throughout the discussion on this issue of reconnecting with the grassroots. And what Mr. Mirel said is, is music to my ears. I also agree with this and don't like this bubble. I feel, I, I feel that it's, 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 uh, uh, it's true what, what, what you are saying. And, uh, and as an organization, we, you know, we started up as a new media platform, as a blog, and then we extended uh, you know, with the think tank work. But our most important work, I feel, is the youth critical thinking program that we do with young activists on the ground. And after doing that for five years, today we see the young people uh, uh, you know, leading the new movements on environment, on gender, and it's the people who are in our workshops. And I think we need to do more of, of that as civil society. And, I, and this is what I mentioned also yesterday in the civil society forum, uh, 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 is this the, the generational change that is happening. Who has the energy to drive these things? Uh, obviously, we're getting also getting a little bit old. It's the 20 year olds. And they have a different view of things. They have a whole new, they grow up in a different context. They, you know, and the things that are buzzing them, the environment, gender issues, you know, uh, I think we need to tap into that energy and, and then work with that generation to pass the baton, do not, not limit the, the civil society space uh, sort of by being these kind of gatekeepers. And really, uh, you know, whatever we can provide to, to, to that new generation, rights-based groups, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, they can start from the environment, but that can move into a political movement as Zagreb has shown. But uh, by starting from the environment or gender, they can go into corruption because they are, the corruption is a horizontal issue that touches upon all these issues. So whatever is working and, and creating buzz within younger generations, that's where the potential is. And I think, I think that's, if we, if we focus on helping the, uh, those who have the energy uh, to do more than just these kind of thinking and the, and the, and the bubble, I think that 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 will be a good start. I'll thank everyone again for uh, for a wonderful uh, a wonderful discussion and wonderful contribution. Uh, you know, uh, we will we will keep uh, being in touch with uh, new outputs and new work. And uh, you know, uh, thank you again and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.